Welcome back, everybody. The History Guy here. Thanks so much for the great response to the first day, the July 1st uh, Gettysburg video as I played as the Confederates on the historic battle here on Ultimate General Civil War. Thank you so much. Please keep that going. If you would drop a like on this video right now as we get started, I would greatly appreciate that and plan on commenting. Uh, it's a great way for us just to talk about the Battle of Gettysburg, talk about the people involved. Uh, we're playing through on July 2nd now. And this is Longstreet's assault on the right. Uh, on the Confederate right, it'd be the Union left. And it looks like we're leading the way with some artillery here. Uh, historically, of course, the Union had largely left Little Round Top undefended. And if you've ever been to the Gettysburg battlefield, you will understand the importance of that location. You can stand up there and you can literally see down the entire Union line all the way down uh, to Cemetery Hill easily. Uh, and so it's a great, great uh, position that overlooks the entire battlefield. Incredible strategic importance. Uh, Governor Warren, who was on the staff uh, of the Army of the Potomac, recognized the importance. He comes down here, and there's this road running along behind that runs down into Maryland. And the Fifth Corps was arriving, and they were heading north. And he basically took command and, and said to some brigades, no, you're coming up here. And one of those brigades, of course, belonged to Strong Vincent and uh, the infamous fight that involved the 20th Maine, which we'll talk about more as we get along here, uh, unfolds on Little Round Top. But the 20th Maine was not the only Union unit that fought heroically and fought really, really well that day. Uh, there were a number of units, especially in Vincent's and Weed's brigades, that ha had a key part in all of that. Of course, the other part of this is that uh, as Longstreet's assault is hitting the Union left, uh, they were expecting that you would have the Third Corps right here. Uh, the Second Corps was up at the Union Center, and then to their left was Dan Sickles' Third Corps. Well, Sickles decided he didn't like this position and had moved forward kind of in a V, in a formation around this area here, the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field. And so as Longstreet's assault is coming in and they're expecting to hit the Union way up here, they end up running into him right here. And while uh, Sickles, what he did was stupid and with, was against the direct orders he had been given, it probably actually helped the Union because it kind of messed up the coordination of Longstreet's assault. So we're going to wait and kind of take this slowly uh, while I just kind of see where the Union's in position. I'm really not eager to go down here through Devil's Den and climb up this hill. I'd much rather do what some of the units did uh, in McClaw's division, and that's to kind of come around this side. But the danger is that he gets reinforcements while I'm doing that. Um, so those are the things I have to think about. Really, there's no, there's not necessarily a reason I need to take any of these objectives to win the battle. All I need is one of Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, South Cemetery Ridge, Culp's Hill, and Little Round Top. And I'd honestly, South Cemetery Ridge probably is the easiest of the bunch to take. So we'll sit here and, and we'll let we'll let him come to me if he's willing to do that. And it looks like he might. So these are some of the third core units here. Um, Philip de Trobriand here, he was a French guy. And there's Dan Sickles. We've got um, Graham coming out at me all by his lonesome right now. Evander Law's brigade right here. This is um, this is McClaw's division. Uh, or no, maybe it's Hood's division. Uh, I don't remember now. Um, but they, uh, they were the ones that were attacking the 20th Maine. The 20th Maine was actually kind of back here on the back end of Little Round Top, and then that line curved around. Uh, and so they were kind of being hit from right here, and that's probably where I'll end up eventually going with these guys. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna advance a battery out there. It doesn't seem like the uh, best place to put them. Barksdale was killed, uh, mortally wounded, died I think the next day. One of a number of uh, brigade commanders who fell on July 2nd.
All right, I think maybe we'll start kind of advancing out here. Again, like I said, I don't need to take any of these objectives. So I don't necessarily have to be in a big hurry to do this or real aggressive with it, but if I can advance without a lot of opposition, then I'll go ahead and give that a try. It might be hard to get some guns up on this hill, especially with all the woods, but we'll see what happens. These guys are out of my range, so maybe I will go ahead and plop this battery out there in front, at least for now. We'll throw this one over there. I've still got two more. Of course, uh, Longstreet, and especially Hood, who was one of his division commanders, pleaded to be allowed to go around the Union line further to the right rather than attacking up through this terrible ground here. Uh, of course, that was denied. Lee wanted to attack both flanks of the Union Army simultaneously. It didn't happen that way. But that was the plan, was that um, an attack would be happening over on the Union right, over at Culp's Hill, while this attack was going on down on the far end on the Union left to make it harder for them to be able to kind of shift forces from one side to the other. It was a brilliant, uh, and I know anybody who studied the Battle of Gettysburg already knows this, but uh, the Union had an absolutely brilliant line uh, a defensive position for this battle. Uh, the fish hook made it really easy for them to get... Uh, reinforcements from one side to the other. In fact, that happened during the July 2nd battle uh, because there was a hole, and I think this will probably open up at some point in the battle today uh, on this game. There was a hole that opened up in the line because of, of Sickles moving his line forward. And some of these Confederate regiments were headed toward that hole. And they had to rush for reinforcements over on the Union right on Culp's Hill, but they hadn't arrived yet. And so that was where the first Minnesota heroically charges with just over 200 men into an entire Confederate brigade and, and takes something like 80% casualties, but in the process saves the Union Center. All right, let's go ahead and move these guns up. I don't know where exactly Longstreet was during this fight. I assume he was back here somewhere. got Locke pretty much in his historical position. I mean, he pretty much came in and attacked down through this valley in between Big Round Top and Little Round Top. Alright, let's get Robertson up. Yeah, we're going to pretty much sit tight here. Um, like I said, not in a big hurry. I've got an advantage in numbers, but he's going to get reinforcements. I'm assuming that Vincent's brigade's up here, maybe even Weeds as well. Of course, they say that uh, Confederate sharpshooters set up in Devil's Den once they had taken that position, and they were shooting at, trying to pick off officers up here on Little Round Top. And uh, there's a story, I believe it involves... Stephen Weed, who was one of the brigade commanders up on Little Round Top, uh, he and the guy that uh, Hazlitt, I think. No, it wasn't Hazlitt. Hazlitt was up on um, Cemetery Ridge. But there was a, a battery commander up here. Oh, they've got the 20th Maine with their own little unit there. Um, and I think they were both ended up being killed. But I'll look it up. I want to. I want to make sure I get the story right. But I know it involved something about one of the men leaning over the other one uh, to kind of hear his last wishes and then the guy getting shot while it happened. I'm looking that up for you right now and make sure I get it right. So uh, just reading a little bit here from the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. At Gettysburg, uh, Weed's brigade went to the relief of Colonel Strong Vincent's brigade on Little Round Top. The vanguard repelled a Confederate attack that had outflanked Vincent's right. Colonel Patrick O'Rourke of the 140th New York 
was killed leading that counterattack. And if you go to the little round top, you'll see um, the monument to the 140th New York and Patrick O'Rourke. And I believe his is the one that has the face um, where people rub the nose for good luck. And the nose is a completely different color than the rest of the of the bust. Um, Elements of Weeds. Oh, it was Hazlitt. Okay. Elements of Weeds Brigade helped move the guns of Lieutenant Charles Hazlitt's battery D, 5th U.S. Artillery, to the top of the hill. Weed was mortally wounded in the chest, possibly by a sharpshooter hidden in Devil's Den. And uh, while standing near those guns, his last words were reported, I would rather die here than the rebels should gain an inch of ground. And it says Lieutenant Hazlitt was killed trying to hear what Weed was saying. So that, that is what happened. Weed was laying there and Hazlitt leaned over him to hear what he was saying and then he was killed himself. A lot of little stories like that that just really uh, kind of bring this battle to life and give you a real sense of what was going on. Now Law, they, he continually charged up this hill at Chamberlain. We're not gonna do that. Um, I'm just going to sit tight. I really would like to get some guns up here, but I don't know how easily that can be done. And Ward's got a pretty solid position here. He's not in Devil's Den. Devil's Den's on this side of the creek, but he's kind of right next to it. But we don't want to just shoot it out like this because Law's not going to get the better end of that deal. Bring the supplies over. I don't know how easily these guns are going to go up here, but I'm going to go ahead and speed things up. Same thing with Anderson, man. He's taking a lot of casualties and not really inflicting as many as I would like to see. These guns aren't really causing a lot of casualties either. This must be a really strong position here. So I think we're going to just go ahead and charge. Try to dislodge Ward from that spot. There we go. Oh, there's Dan Sickles. Coming over to see what's going on. So Sickles is, <laughs> he's an interesting fellow to say the least. And uh, we talked a little bit about him yesterday during the July 1st battle. And if you didn't see that first, uh, first part of this battle, uh, I'll put a link in the description below so that you can see my playthrough of the historic battle of day one. And kind of our talk through that so I won't go back over everything I already talked about concerning sickles but um, kind of gave a little bit of his history and talked about what he was doing before the war um, so sickles at this point is in command of the third corps he's out supervising his position out here uh, around the wheat field the peach orchard everything and he takes um, a cannonball to the leg all but rips his leg off. Uh, it has to be amputated, uh, but he is put on a stretcher, and while he's on the stretcher, he lights up a cigar uh, for his men to see, just kind of this act of heroism to let them know what a bad you-know-what he was. Uh, pretty interesting cat, Dan Sickles. Uh, lived a long time. He lived, I think, into his 90s. Uh, he lived long enough to attend the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, which brought thousands of veterans from north and south back to the battlefield. You can actually see some early uh, film of Dan Sickles. There's one leg with his cigar, white hair, still's got the mustache, um, visiting the battlefield. Pretty cool to be able to see that he lived long enough to see all of that. All right, so the battlefield's going to open up now. And now we're, we're going to see a little bit more of the battlefield. And here's South Cemetery Ridge. And we could actually probably take this and end the battle here. Not going to do that, though. We're going to take this all the way to Pickett's Charge. But we will try to inflict some casualties and push him back. And for now, I'm mainly just trying to do the same over here. We're going to do our best to take out the 20th Main. I did get my guns up here. I don't think historically that happened just because they would have had to have cleared a lot of the trees. Uh, little Round Top was pretty clear of trees. The back end had trees, but the front end, the face, was pretty well open. And uh, Big Round Top, different story. Very heavily wooded, and so it didn't really make for the same opportunities. 
but we're gonna go ahead and advance a little bit with these units here. Let's go ahead and speed things along a little bit. Chamberlain's not gonna last. They did just get some reinforcements. This was Chamberlain's first battle as the commanding officer of the 20th Maine. Adelbert Ames had been the, the colonel in charge of that unit up until that point, but he had been promoted and given a brigade in the 11th Corps fought on July 1st. And of course we all know how well Chamberlain acquitted himself in this battle. They, they undergo repeated assaults on their position and they repel every one of them. He sends one of his companies out into this kind of no man's land out here so they can kind of keep an eye out for what's going on. Doesn't hear anything from them, assumes they've been wiped out. He takes part of his force and bends it back so that they're kind of in a wide V shape just to protect, because he's the end of the line. He's the far left flank of the Union Army. And he's been given orders to not to retreat under any circumstances by Colonel Vincent. So he's, he's out of ammunition and he has no choice. He can either retreat or he can get overrun. And so he decides to fix, fix bayonets and as Law's men are attacking up the hill again, he charges down the hill and ends up capturing a ton of their men uh, and repelling the attack finally. Of course, that's not happening here, but they swung this one half around like a gate and then kind of charged down the hill. Uh, of course, Chamberlain was given the Medal of Honor for that. It was hardly his only um, heroic or active bravery moment during the war. He had a number of those at Petersburg. He was pretty much given up for dead. He was shot through both hips. I think he ended up being wounded six times during the war. Uh, everybody thought he had died. I think some people even published his obituary. But he did survive and he was given the honor by General Grant of receiving the Confederate surrender, the ceremonial um, reception of the surrender at Appomattox. He was a brevet major general by that point in charge of a division. And uh, I think it was John, B John Gordon's men who were marching past and Chamberlain called his men to attention to salute the Confederates as they passed uh, in surrender. And Gordon returned the salute and uh, it's a really cool thing to read about uh, Gordon's account of what happened. But Gordon went on to call Chamberlain, the knightliest soldier in the Federal Army. Uh, he thought very highly of Chamberlain, as did everyone who knew him. Uh, he's just one of those people that you'll very rarely find anything negative said about. Uh, after the war, he becomes the governor of Maine, president of Bowdoin College, uh, where he'd been a professor when the war broke out. And I think played very well by Jeff Daniels in the movies Gettysburg and Gods and Generals. But uh, no, I'm not going to try to take Little Round Top. I'm going to sit tight because I am trying to play this out historically as best I can. Though I should be in a better position than the historic Confederate Army was just because of how I'm doing this. Yeah, we're going to target these guns. Crawford's division spotted, so there's some more reinforcements coming for the Federals. He may actually overrun me over here on Big Round Top at some point. And that's okay if he does, as long as I can take a lot of his men with me. So far on the day, looks like uh, about nearly 5,000 casualties inflicted, and I've only lost about 1,500 men. But yeah, he's coming at me strong now. So there's Stephen Weed coming up. Day, Burbank. I think these are all 5th Corps units. A lot of the Union regulars, uh, not the volunteer troops from states, but the, uh, the regular troops, I believe, were in the 5th Corps. Let's see if we, can, uh, we can't quite target that battery there. Target that one or this one. Right, as long as we're inflicting at least as many as we're taking. Look at Robertson. 963 kills, just 100, 104 deaths. We're taking out both of these batteries. Yeah, 
pretty well gonna sit tight with these guys. Of course, this is the angle. This is kind of the focal point of Pickett's charge on day three. I'm gonna back Posey off because he's not gonna win that fight. But this is where we probably could push through and do a number on him. Here comes Standard who played a part on July 3rd as well. That's uh, what I believe was known as the Paper Collar Brigade, the Vermont troops that only served for one year. Not even a year. But we're just gonna sit tight and play this out. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this battle on July 2nd. Uh, it was a great book that I just read and off the top of my head, I can't remember who the author was, but it's just about the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, there was so much that happened that day, a lot worth studying. I believe we'll probably have to go to Little Round Top, or not Little Round Top, uh, Culp's Hill at some point here on July 2nd because that was a part of the, the day's fight as well. But not a lot going to happen here, I don't think. Oh, here comes Dorsey Pender's division. I believe that's 3rd Corps. Yeah, I think it is because 1st Corps um, divisions in the Confederate Army were McClaws, Hood, and Pickett. So Heath, Pender, I can't remember off the top of my head who the 3rd Division Commander was in the 3rd Corps. Then it was the, the Confederate Second Corps that I think was up over on the uh, Confederate left, which would have been where Culp's Hill was. Man, he is loading up over here now. So Jubal early. Edward Johnson and Robert Rhodes were the second Corps division commanders. Man, Benning just got lit up by Weed's attack there. So then the third Corps is uh, Richard Anderson, this is the third one that I couldn't think of, uh, Henry Heath, and Dorsey Pender. Yeah, we're just gonna hang tight. If, if these guys get overrun and I lose them, so be it. But they're gonna take a lot of guys with them. And that's the plan here. I've lost uh, about 5,000 men, but inflicted 13,000 casualties. I could push here, if nothing else, to try and cause some casualties. Make it easier when I get to day three, because these are the troops that are gonna def be defending. For Pickett's charge. Although, if he comes at me, then even better. Let's get these guns up here. I need to get Robertson over here and replace Benning. I think Benning's had about all he can take. Oh, Law just fell back. Okay. done, Robertson. What are they armed with? Oh, they've got CSR 1855s. Those are pretty nice weapons. They're three-star unit. They're about as elite as you can get. Uh, this is a bad position now because we're getting flanked over here. That's why nobody can hold it. Let's take out these batteries.
All right, we'll go ahead and drop out because I don't think a lot more is going to happen here. They might overrun this position, uh, but I want to go ahead and skip ahead to the fight at Culp's Hill. So this is how the situation ends up as the timer ticks down and we're actually getting toward towards midnight uh, here on July 2nd on this side of the battle. Uh, I actually went out and grabbed some of his supplies and wiped out a couple batteries and then brought the supplies back because I was just about out of... Uh, supply here. R Robertson's just about wiped out because he rushed a bunch more units south. But man, I did a number on him here. I inflicted something like 20,000 casualties just on that side. Now we go to Culp's Hill. Now this Culp's Hill attack, like I said, was supposed to happen simultaneous to Longstreet's attack on the right. Didn't happen that way at all. It ended up being like a half hour before night before uh, this attack finally uh, commences. And so uh, it looks like we've got a lot going on here. We should have Johnson's division over here and then Jubal Early's division probably up here. So we've got a lot more showing than I expected to. Uh, these are some of the units that were involved in the first day's fight. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but in case you ever wondered what happened to units uh, from the Union First Corps, the Union First Corps fought incredibly well, fought as well as any uh, Corps ever did in any battle on either side uh, during the first day's fight, but uh, they were they were in rough shape after that first day. They they lost something like forty to 50 fifty percent casualties, so they were pretty much out of it as far as being an effective unit. So, um, but Wadsworth's uh, division, the first division of the first Corps, which had uh, the Iron Brigade, had Cutler's Brigade in it, they were actually stationed up here on Culp's Hill. I think they were up here kind of on the north side of Culp's Hill, and that's where they were placed uh, when the action happens on July 2nd. Now, I believe the Confederate attack came up this way, uh, so they weren't really kind of in the line of fire. Uh, there was 1,300 Union men um, and one brigade that basically, or 1,600 uh, Union men uh, that threw off this attack, and they actually did get outflanked at one point and had to fall back, but then they just fell back to another line of breastworks. It was a strong position, and I have no interest whatsoever in attacking it. Uh, but we will talk a little bit about Culp's Hill, since I'm not going to actually attack it. One of the most interesting stories, of course, that many people I'm sure have heard, uh, concerns a young man named Wesley Culp, who I believe was a nephew to the family that owned this farm. Now, they're distant cousins of my wife. Uh, my wife has ancestors who were German, and their name was Kolb, K-O-L-B that settled here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, they came from Adams County, Pennsylvania, where Gettysburg is. In fact, one of my wife's like great, 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 great grandfathers is buried in uh, the Evergreen Cemetery um, there on Cemetery Hill in Gettysburg. Uh, so the Culps were actually cousins of theirs. All right, so anyway, about Wesley Culp. So Wesley grows up uh, on uh, on the family farm there, a little around, or at uh, Culp's Hill, he eventually goes south a couple years before the war, I believe, to Virginia uh, to work. Um, he goes there. He ends up, uh, when the war breaks out, enlisting in the Confederate Army. Uh, of course, Gettysburg's not far north of the Mason-Dixon line, just a few miles, and um, he probably grew up knowing people who were slave owners, things like that. Um, not sure why he chose the South when the war broke out, um, but he obviously had strong ties. So anyway, he comes back uh, as a member of the Confederate Army and finds himself on July 2nd fighting on that farm that he probably played on as a kid and ends up being mortally wounded there and uh, probably buried somewhere on that land. So it was just kind of a sad situation, just one of those many stories that... Uh, just really kind of tug at your heartstrings about the battle. Uh, of course, another one that happened, I believe, on July 2nd. Um, over here on Cemetery Ridge, or Cemetery Hill, um, a young man was wounded uh, with, I think, the 73rd Ohio. His name was Private George Nixon. Uh, I, I shouldn't say young man. He was in his 40s, had a huge family at home back in Ohio. Uh, I believe he had been shot through the hip and seriously wounded, and he lay out between the lines uh, before the battle and uh, I'll put a, a link in the description to my video or my visit to the cemetery uh, the National Cemetery because I visited Nixon's grave but uh, one of his buddies who heard him kind of crying out for help 
laying in between the lines, uh, crawled out to try and rescue him and was able to pull him back uh, through the lines. His name was Richard Enderlin. And uh, Richard Enderlin crawls out under this constant fire at nighttime, drags Richard, or, uh, Private George Nixon back to their own lines, and uh, then eventually stood up and uh, dashed this final distance to safety with George Nixon. Well, George Nixon did pass away from his wounds, but Richard Enderlin was instantly promoted to sergeant and was 34 years later given the Medal of Honor for his actions. Uh, Private Nixon was the great-grandfather of future U.S. President Richard Nixon. Uh, now, whatever you think of President Nixon, uh, it's kind of cool to know that there at the Gettysburg National Cemetery is buried the great-grandfather of a future U.S. president who was killed at Gettysburg. Um, there are other stories like that of famous people's relatives who fought at Gettysburg. Some of them were descendants of people from the Revolution, um, also some people who were ancestors of people who would come to prominence. Um, for example, uh, there was a, uh, I think Walter Tazewell Patton was killed leading a, a regiment in Pickett's division on uh, July 3rd at Pickett's Charge, and he was an uncle to future General George Patton. Uh, I think George Patton's grandfather also may have been uh, in Pickett's Charge. If not, I know he was also uh, in the Confederate Army, and I think he himself was killed at some point. But those are just some of the, the interesting things. We're not going to actually fight any of this part, so I'm going to probably just go ahead and wrap it up right here. But as always, let me know your thoughts. Um, let me know what you think about the action on July 2nd. What should each side maybe have done differently? What could they have done differently that might have altered the outcome or made it better for one side or the other? Um, what are some stories uh, that I've talked about or that I didn't talk about that have always stood out to you that you find interesting about July 2nd. Use that comment section below and we will come back uh, either Saturday or Sunday with the July 3rd fight. As always, guys, thanks for watching and we'll see you again soon.